producing oxygen. Lot, we're producing a lot of oxygen. Mm -hmm. That's the byproduct. And, and going back to these other feedstocks that we're talking about, mm -hmm. we're talking about corn, we're talking about palm, there are a lot of externalities that often don't enter into this discussion. You know, corn, again, we were talking about monocropping, but you're looking at putting all these fertilizers, all these pesticides, all these inputs into a field system, which largely go on to, you know, soak into the groundwater, go downstream. You know, this is an old conversation, but it's something that often gets left out of the biofuels conversation. With palm, even though you are producing much more oil per acre, it's very destructive in that... A lot of where palm is grown is in the tropics, right. in tropical rainforests, and in one case in Malaysia, we're talking about going and ripping out an incredibly biologically diverse area. It goes back to this monocropping. It's a, it's a disaster waiting to happen. Right, and then and you have a maximum yield that drops off after about 10 years. It just goes downhill like yeah. that. So algae, again, seems like something that you know, is well-suited for biofuels, and a lot of people have been talking about it. I think there are, the last time I checked, about 22 different companies that are working on some aspect of using algae for right. biofuels. And the thing that I was thinking about, and I was talking to, or actually I was emailing with Dave Jones from Live Fuels, is that what we're talking about at the end of the day is a commodity market. It's a sort of marketplace where everybody can win, oh, so to say, and everybody can remain cost yeah. competitive. And in talking to people, not only within the clean tech market, but especially in the sort of algae market, there seems to be a lot of collaboration. There seems to be a lot of patting one another on the back and looking to either partner or exchange information on down the line. There isn't this fierce competition. There isn't this us and them business mentality that often gets painted in the news. And I was just wondering whether you might speak about you know, some, some of the other people that are out there working or some of the other technology that is fascinating to your, you think well, you I might mean, factor in? You know, part of this is uh, the situation that we're in from an, both an energy standpoint and an environmental standpoint is so massive. I mean, we, we've got ourselves in a, in a pinch here, mm. and it's not a little pinch. It's a great big one. And there's not going to be one solution. Uh, it's going to have – the only way this is going to work is we're going to have to have a lot of solutions, Okay. So we have to find ways of working together uh, across these, these boundaries from a business standpoint to pull this off to get us back where we need to be. And from that standpoint, you know, there, there's a lot of people that uh, you know, I talk to on a, on a regular basis and other companies. Okay, uh, A lot of people are looking at, at uh, how they can genetically modify an organism. Uh, to kick up the lipid content uh, to make it more effective at doing this. We, we on the other hand, look at uh, indigenous species, okay, that is not modified. Uh, our reactor system may work just as well for a, a genetically modified organism uh, than, than any, anything else. So, you know, if I, if I can supply reactors to someone that, that wants to do that, I have no problem with that. Uh, there, there's a lot of collaboration that's possible. Now, when we're, we're talking about algae, we are talking about big numbers. The, the propensity numbers. to produce 100,000 gallons per acre is tantalizing. But one of the main issues that is often brought up when I talk to people in this sector about developing biofuels and developing algal biofuels especially, how do you scale up? How do you have these huge installations of over 1,000 acres? How do you manage those things? How do you control the costs? Uh, do you have any sort of studies that are ongoing to measure the economic viability of producing and managing yeah. large systems? Well, the, 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 the trick to doing it from a, a large scale, we believe, is uh, we've built everything down to a very small modular unit, mm -hmm. and we just plug in one module after another module after another module. One, I don't want 1,000 acres of one culture of algae. If something were to go wrong, uh, I've lost everything. It's all gone. But if I break this up into uh, a quarter of an acre module or a half an acre module or even an acre module, okay, uh, and just to worry about that module, uh, everything is automated. So we've built a, a fairly sophisticated computer control system that can look at all of these parameters that are going on, monitor all of this real time, and it's being able to just plug one unit after another unit after another unit after another unit. From that standpoint, it becomes uh, very manageable. Uh, you don't have to go out and build a 1,000 acres day one and wait for some period to turn it on. You build the first unit, you turn it on, it's producing. You add the second unit, turn it on, it's producing. Add the third unit, turn it on, and it's producing. And so that's our approach, this modular design. Now, something that I would like you 
to do for us is mm -hmm. walk us through your system. You know, we've been talking about this system, we've been talking about these modules, but explain it to me. Not everybody has seen the pictures, okay. not everybody has seen your video, which is very good. I would definitely tell everybody to go on Valson's website and check out their video because it's extremely well done and it definitely sets you apart from the field because a lot of other companies or a lot of other people that are talking about algal-based biofuels have a lot of proprietary speak, a lot of proprietary language, and a lot of secrecy, which is understandable because people want to guard their investments. Right. Investors don't want their property, intellectual property, to be stolen. But you've gone out, you've put in a lot of information on your website, a lot of facts, and you have this video which actually shows your physical installation, your uh, your trial beds that you're working yeah. on. So I, I would encourage everybody to go check this out because it's beautiful. But well, we, we, we can do that because I, I have some very good patent attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> if you would please explain or describe or paint a picture of the system and how it works. Uh, imagine some very large plastic bags. And when I say large, they're four feet wide by 10 feet long. And start hanging them one after another like you would hang them in a closet. Uh, these bags have been configured so they have, they look like a radiator with a series of baffles that go through them. We stack them you know, horizontally across this, this surface. Uh, well, actually, they're hanging vertically, but from a, a distance. So you have a whole bunch of them. I mean, lots and lots and lots. If you're talking about an acre, you're talking about you know thousands of these hanging. And those are what we refer to as our photobioreactors. Uh, the algae gets pumped through there in a continuous process. So a pump uh, down at the, the main t holding tank picks the algae up, brings it up to a manifold, okay, pushes it into the bag, and at that point, gravity takes over. And the algae flows through this bag, and while it's flowing through the bag, it's being exposed to the sunlight. And that's where the magic happens. Okay, because in, in the simplest terms, this is a giant solar collector. That's what we're doing. We're, we're collecting solar radiation and converting it into another form of usable energy. Uh, once, once the algae has gone through the bag, uh, gravity takes it, uh, carries it back to a, a central holding tank uh, where we bubble mass amounts of air through. And I mean massive amounts. Keep the algae uh, aerated with the carbon dioxide. It also breaks off the excess oxygen that's produced during this photosynthetic process and puts it back into the atmosphere. And that's the, it's, it's that simple. And at the end of the process, you have a fair amount of algae that might have multiplied once, twice, maybe even exactly. six times, depending and on when, the species. When we, get the, when we get the cell density that we want and everything is ready, then during the course of a day, we will harvest half of the volume of that fluid. So okay. you sort of cut it in the middle. Exactly. We cut okay. it in the middle. So it's just a, a stream gets diverted off one way going to the harvesting, and another stream goes back to the main tank. And the water from the harvesting, once it's the, the algae has been pulled out, then that water is returned, sterilized, and brought back into the system. Now, something that interests me, and I think probably interests a lot of other people that are following uh, algae biofuels production, is that you're talking about continuous harvesting systems. Absolutely. And not, not that you're waiting until the end of the week or the end of the no. month and just like taking everything and trying to flush it out and start all over in, again. In order for this to be successful for, you know, the, the production levels that are required as a feedstock for biodiesel or biofuels, uh, this has to be a continuous process. How do you harvest, and also I guess as a corollary, how do you grow these algae not only at night when there's no light or it's colder outside, but also in differing seasons or in differing environments? Well, being a plant, the, they, they require a dark period to go through what we call respiration. So they have to have dark. So that plays a, a critical role in these guys doing what we want them to do. Uh, so that doesn't bother us. Uh, as far as harvesting, uh, it's just a continuous process, so this, this fluid never stops, day or night. And we just pull off just the right amount to reach half, of, half the volume in a 24-hour cycle. Uh, in the next 24-hour cycle, that's replicated itself, so we're right back where we started. And we just keep it going. Day and night doesn't make any difference. Now, once you actually have your <coughs> algae harvested and you have them collected at a certain density, how do you extract the oil from the algae? How do you separate out there, the biomass? There's a, there's a variety of off-the-shelf technologies uh, from using a centrifuge to filtration methods. Uh, uh, we are actually developing a charged microbubble flocculation technique. Now, that's a mouthful. Okay? Uh, we hope to have that online sometime mid-2008 because it's very, very, very cost-effective. Okay. Which is something worth talking about. What sort of costs would you expect to come into a system that is an acre, you know, basic standard acre module? 
Well, our partners, Global Green, uh, who are the, the, the guys that will actually do the commercialization on this, they're putting an acre facility at a million dollars. Seems okay. pretty cost effective. Yeah. And what sort of, uh, again, what sort of inputs are we talking about? Are we talking about a lot of the cost coming from building the infrastructure? Or are we talking about actually just maintaining the... It's, it's the, the build-out. Okay, the build so out that's cost. the build-out. Yeah. Now, in terms of water usage and electricity usage, what can we expect for operating these systems? Uh, fairly, fairly low. The, the water cost, uh, you, you've got a lot of water volume, but because we conserve so much of it, uh, it's not you know, out of the range of what we're looking for at all. And you, I mean, re you recycle my, I, I, or reuse? Oh, yeah, we recycle everything. Okay. I mean, the, the goal here, it, it doesn't do us any good to grow this and, and to go through this whole exercise if we can't be cost competitive with other fuel sources. And 